Hello and welcome to the latest Moneymakers Weekly Investment Trust podcast. I'm Jonathan Davis, the editor of the Investment Trust Handbook, and your host for this weekly review of all the latest news and developments affecting the investment trust sector. My thanks to JP Morgan Asset Management for agreeing to sponsor the podcast, which as a result will now remain free for the foreseeable future. Moneymakers is an independent research and publishing venture with a mission to explain and inform. But I must remind you that for regulatory reasons, nothing you hear from any speaker today should be regarded as constituting individual investment advice. It was a disappointing week for those who've been looking forward keenly to early interest rate cuts this year. While holding rates unchanged at their latest rate-setting meetings, the heads of both the Federal Reserve in the US and the Bank of England over here went out of their way to dampen expectations of an early cut. And then on Friday, the latest monthly jobs data release in the US, which showed new jobs being added at twice the rate the market was anticipating, and once again underlining the resilience of the US economy, despite all those recent interest rate rises, That effectively scotched any lingering hopes that the cuts in interest rates would come as early as March this year. To be fair, the messaging from the Bank of England was a little ambiguous on this count, with two of the nine members on the Monetary Policy Committee advocating a cut and one voting for a further increase. That seems to underline the general perception that current economic trends are proving challenging for everyone to interpret correctly. In any event, although the announcement of the jobs data came too late to have much influence on European markets, it was enough to send US bond yields notably higher on Friday. Surprisingly, perhaps, the stock market also had a good day on Friday, with the S&P 500 up more than 1%, the Nasdaq slightly more. Although it was an important week also for company earnings reports, about a third of the S&P 500 index put out their latest quarterly earnings reports this week, with big tech again to the fore, most notably in the case of Meta, if that's Facebook to you and I, which combined impressive figures with an announcement of its first ever dividend. And that was enough to send the shares up something like 20% over the week. And Amazon, which also reported better than expected figures. The only one of the Magnificent Seven, which is not doing so well, is Tesla, which is down because of delays and cost overruns, while prices for electric vehicles are also coming down. Uh, The Japanese market again put in another good performance, I'm happy to say, while the Chinese market sold off again, with the big news there being a court order in Hong Kong that the huge over-leveraged Evergrande property business, whose future has been in doubt for several years now, should be liquidated. That may trigger further repercussions across the very overextended property sector in China. It was a more mundane affair on this side of the Atlantic, with the FTSE All Share Index down a fraction on the week, and the FTSE 250 index are down a little bit more than that. Unlike their US counterparts, gilts finished the week higher, and would have finished even higher still, but for a sharp sell-off yesterday. The Investment Trust Index was down 0.5% on the week, while the average sector discount widened by a similar sort of margin to around 15.5%. Losers slightly outnumbered gainers this week, the list of losers again being headed by the Battery Storage Trusts, two of which Gore Street Energy Storage, ticker GSF, and Harmony Energy Income Trust, ticker HEIT, have announced that they are suspending their latest dividends because of falling revenues and delays in the planned new system of grid connectivity that was and is expected to favour them when it's finally introduced. There was no particular clear theme on the other side of the performance ledger, although global Japanese and a number of smaller company trusts are among those making a decent showing. This week in the podcast, I talked to Matt Hose, who is the alternatives analyst at the investment bank and broker Jefferies, about how the yo-yoing of interest rate expectations is affecting developments in the sectors he covers. He's recently been on a month-long round of visits to clients talking about the outlook for the year ahead and is well-placed, therefore, to report back on what is on professional trust investors' minds. After that, I have a catch-up with Peter Hewitt, the manager of the CT Global Managed Portfolio, to talk about the markets and discounts. Are we out of the woods as far as the derating that we saw last year is concerned? And we also hear about the trust that he's been buying as he looks ahead to what he believes and hopes will be a mildly positive outlook this year. Our profile this week is a timely one and features Gore Street Energy Storage, ticker GSF, which is one of the three battery storage trusts which have been heading the list of losers year to date. This one has fared better than its two peers, 
the shares are down a little over 20%, uh, which compares to the 50% declines of the others. So that's a relative uh, prosperity, I would say, though not, of course, much encouragement to its shareholders. Uh, but thanks to its timely decision to diversify away from the UK into other markets. I did note this week that a couple of directors have been buying shares in Gresham House Energy Storage, one of the other trusts, presumably on the grounds that the sell-off has gone too far. It does have such a dramatic, sharp declines do have a flavour of the herd instinct about them. It may therefore be a good moment to dig into what's been going on in this specialist, but not insignificant subsector of the renewable energy universe. Although these battery storage trusts are relative newcomers to the market, they have raised a significant amount of capital by issuing shares both at IPO and subsequently. For subscribers to the Money Makers Circle, as well as this latest trust profile, we have our usual summary of all the most important news coming out of the sector, together with tables of the most notable movements in share prices, discounts and NAVs, and our new regular expanded weekly email, which covers all of these and adds commentary on the news and markets. You can find out more or sign up for that weekly email by visiting our website, money-makers.co. The flow of news in the sector accelerated again this week with 11 companies, including several UK smaller company trusts, reporting results and the same number announcing their latest quarterly NAVs. Seven of the 11 trusts reporting results produced negative NAV total returns. And as the reporting periods mostly covered the period of derating we saw last year, greater share price total return declines as well. The quarterly updates came mostly from commercial property and renewable energy trusts with modest NAV declines for the fourth quarter last year, the norm. Among the other news you can follow in the weekly email are impending manager changes at three trusts, Vietnam Enterprise, ticker V-E-I-L, JP Morgan American, ticker J-A-M, and Bailey Gifford China Growth, ticker BGCG. You can also find details of a new dividend and capital allocation policy that the board of Harbourvest Global Private Equity, ticker HVPE, are proposing, and the proposed managed wind-down of Digital 9 Infrastructure, ticker DGI9, which has failed to convince its shareholders to back its continuation after accumulating too much debt on its balance sheet to fund all its commitments. The tide of rationalisation is clear across the sector is set to continue. And we'll be tracking that, of course, in all our podcasts over the next few weeks. Number 200 is coming up uh, quite soon. So that will be a landmark, which uh, personally, at least, I'll be celebrating. I hope you will join me then next week and for that particular episode in a couple of weeks time. This seemed a good week to uh, catch up again with one of our regular guests on the podcast, which is uh, Matt Hose, who's responsible for uh, analysing investment trust in the alternative asset space for Jefferies, the investment bank and broking firm. Uh, particularly good week, I think, because we kicked off the new year and obviously performance picked up quite nicely across the sector in the last couple of months, uh, perhaps long overdue, Matt, you could say. But you put out an annual outlook just before Christmas and have been uh, talking to clients about that since then. So it's a good opportunity to catch up on what you think about what's happening in some of the main alternative asset sectors. But first of all, perhaps I might just ask you about where you think the sector overall is heading, alternatives in particular. We've seen, obviously, as I said, this re-rating since the end of October, and it's eased off a bit this year. What is your outlook for the year ahead for the trust you cover? We can delve into the outlook on individual stocks and subsectors, but just, you know, having been out there talking to investors over the last month, it feels like there's cautious optimism building for 2024. Part of that is the macro feels a bit better, Another part is that the cost disclosure issues that have plagued the sector for a year, 18 months now, it feels like we're on the path to getting those rectified and there's been some positive announcements out there. And the only, I think the big challenge against that at this stage is just on, on the technical side is finding new buyers because we've seen ARBs and various hedge funds play discounts and get a bit of discount contraction in there. But what we really have to find is a new generation of buyers, particularly replacing some of those multi-asset flows that we saw over the last 18 months. Indeed. And obviously, uh, as you say, finding buyers is always an important part of the process. <laughs> and what you mean is basically you want some of the long-term holders to come back, not just the ARPs. Yeah, I think long-term holders, but also you know, we're always out there looking for new investors in the space. So whether it's 
ESG funds, private capital, pockets of overseas money. It's just, you know, some of the more traditional investors have reduced their holdings because, you know, things like fixed income, the opportunity set there has, has been more interesting than it has been for 10 years. And so we, we need to find investors to try and replace that, basically. Yes. And so therefore, you're having to fight on several fronts at the same time or against several headwinds. Mm-hmm. The consequence of that, of course, is around liquidity. Certainly, if you're a private investor, you want to try and buy some of these trusts on a big discount. The spreads are pretty wide, aren't they? That is a problem that also needs to be resolved, does it not? I think there's a big picture issue on liquidity. I mean, liquidity on some of the larger names is okay, but on smaller subscale names, it's a particular problem. And I think a lot of investors will rely on, you know, boards and the governance arrangements of the funds, basically deliver them an exit. And one thing I think we have to see over the next couple of years is a smaller sector in terms of number of trusts, because I think we need to circle the wagons around the larger, more liquid investable opportunities. There have been lots of positive noises about the cost disclosure issue. Do you think we are in sight of a, of a sensible solution here? And will it be the one that the sort of campaign group is looking for? I've been slightly sort of sceptical about this in one sense. I mean, we'll find out if we do change the cost disclosure rules and discounts don't move at all, then maybe it's all been because the other issues like rising interest rates have been a bigger factor than the cost disclosure issue. What do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, because of the hard work by the campaign group, it definitely feels we're on the right path. What we don't know is the ultimate impact because the sector has been a a bit of a mess over the last 18 months. It's clearly been a negative, but we don't know how much of a negative. And so when it does get rectified, is it the absence of a negative or is it a material positive? And that's difficult to sort of extract from current discounts, current prices, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. So, well, let's talk about some of the sectors that you cover then. Let's start off with the one which I guess many people think is most affected or most influenced by what's happening to interest rates and interest rates expectations. And that would be the kind of general infrastructure sector where there is quite a close correlation between what's happened to uh, interest rate bond yields and bond yield expectations. What is your feeling about how that sector is going to play out this year? They obviously haven't kicked off the year too well after rallying in the autumn. What are your thoughts on that sector, first of all, overall? So because of that movement we saw in long-term bond yields towards the latter part of last year, we actually think that discount rates now up with events. And, you know, we're actually out there saying discount rates don't need to increase from here on in, but actually they don't need to decrease at this stage. And what's likely to happen is transactional activity is still catching up with a higher interest rate environment. So where we have lower bond yields, what we think management teams and valuers are likely to do is just basically maintain the status quo. And so your risk-free rate part of the discount rate comes down, but your risk premium part of the discount rate just expands to offset it. So we're looking at stable discount rates for a while. So that means stable portfolio valuations. Apart from we may start to see some weakness in the inflation assumptions because look at the last couple of inflation prints for the UK. They are slightly below where some of the funds have their uh, inflation assumptions set. So there's a bit of nav weakness coming down the track. And then the question, I guess, is how are trust in the sector responding, or if they are responding to uh, the change in the environment? I mean, there's a lot of talk about what capital allocation and so on across the alternative sector. But are there specific issues for trusts in the broad infrastructure sector that they need to address this year? So there's certain funds which we think are well-placed where, because of their return profile, by investing in those funds, you pick up a healthy premium to current bond yields. And so those funds, we think, do not need to reposition their portfolios. But other funds, which are more in the bond proxy territory, things like Hickel and IMPP, particularly, where your real return in those funds has been compressed over the last couple of years with rising risk-free rates, then we do think those funds need to gradually transition their portfolios. So they need to move basically further up the sort of risk return spectrum and pick up some more risk premium in doing so. And obviously, that's over and above all the things the funds are doing on sort of capital allocation and share buybacks, etc. Yeah, what scope is there for buybacks in this sector? I mean, we haven't seen a great deal, I don't think. Uh, certainly in some other sectors, we've seen more activity. Do you think that uh, the, the boards there are doing enough? So there's a bit more scope for buybacks. So where we've seen funds do material buybacks, like on a, a Sequoia Economic Infrastructure, is where they have clean balance sheets. So they've repaid all their revolving credit facility borrowings. What we think this year is we're going to see some larger 
disposal transactions across the space. So that in turn, that will help clear RCF borrowings. And then you've got clean balance sheets that allows you to do buybacks. So I think once we start to see that uptick in disposals, then we'll probably see some more buybacks towards the second half of the year. I'm just looking through some of the names on the sector. I mean, I'm looking through the performance this year. There's been quite a significant share price weakness in some of these names. You mentioned, obviously, things like BBGI and INPP, but some positive performance from things like 3i Infrastructure and Pantheon Infrastructure. What's been the differentiator between those two? Why are some things rather better than the others? We are seeing a definite uptick in interest on 3IN and Pint. And the unifying theme there is they are higher risk return funds where you pick up a meaningful return premium versus bond yields. So you don't have the risk of discount rates increasing. And, you know, show me the, the portfolios perform to plan, you're going to clip a healthy sort of double digit, low double digit return. And I think the market is increasingly aware of that and, and sort of aligning with that thinking. And at the other end of the scale, before we move on and talk about perhaps the renewables sort of subsector, if you like, of the infrastructure sector, it looks like we're going to lose Digital Nine, right? Looking at the digital infrastructure trusts. Is that a surprise or a disappointment to you? Well, I think we're going to lose Digital Nine, but we're going to lose it over a number of years because the wind down announcement this week was so poorly received you know, with the shares down over the last couple of days, is that it's going to take a long time to realise those assets. So um, in reality, you've got to wait until 2026 for your Vern Global uh, now, and that's assuming the Vern Global sell completes, and I still see risks around the completion risks around that deal. And then in reality, you may need to wait until 2027 to potentially sell Arkiva. So it's a long road to recovering value for DGI and shareholders, and that's why the market can't be that optimistic at present. What do you think really has gone wrong there? I mean, is it just the timing of the things they've done? the sort of mismatch between their ambitions and the market conditions? Or if finger pointing is appropriate, where should one be pointing the finger for really what's gone wrong with this one? Because it looks so promising when it started. It's a really interesting one because the assets are, some of the assets are good and some of the assets are fine. But what it's basically come down to is is over leverage and a stretched balance sheet. They were relying on a capital raise to repay the debt. They couldn't do that. They had to acquire Arkiva with vendor financing, so that was more debt. And then that meant they couldn't fund CapEx, and ultimately they were forced to sell over the best, their best asset, Burn Global. And it's just all unwound pretty horribly from there. So I think ultimately the board has to take some blame, but it's, it largely sits with the, uh, the prior management team, which constructed the portfolio in that way. Presumably because of those specific things, there's not necessarily a read across to Cordiant, for example, is there? I mean, they've still got a future. So what's actually been really unfair for Cordiant is for a point in time last year, the share price was dragged down by the market's views on DJI 9. But no, Cordiant is a completely different situation where it has good assets, which are performing, it has sensible leverage. And on Cordiant, I think what's interesting is we actually think they should make some partial disposals of their two largest assets, but that's just to give them more flexibility in terms of their portfolio structure, more diversification. And in turn, that should help get them on the LSE premium list because they're still sat on the SFS. So no, actually, we think Cord is uh, really well placed. Yeah. It's still on quite a wide discount, though. It's still around, what, 20% or something like that, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on and talk about renewables then. Again, similar sort of story in one sense. We saw a kind of rally in the uh, latter part of last year. Welcome rally, I should say. But again, some weakness so far this year. And that's also about interest rates, but also about people's expectation of power prices looking ahead. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So for renewables, in a nutshell, we think NAVs are probably going to fall this year on the back of power prices. And we can see the UK fall curve or power price curve fell in Q4 and has continued to fall in Q1. So that points to NAV weakness. But actually, we actually think share prices might rise across the sector because we see a lot of corporate activity coming down the track. And that corporate activity, we think it's going to take a number of forms. So the funds are continue to dispose of assets. We think they'll dispose of, of larger assets as buyers can get debt financing. It'd be much easier to get debt financing this year than it was last year with more stable rates. There's a number of discontinuation resolutions that will be triggered, plus there's one or two scheduled continuation votes as well. And then we've also got the potential for M&A across the subsector as well. And we've started to see a little bit of that with the potential uh, octopus and aquila transaction. 
Right. It's interesting, isn't it? I mean, there's been a lot more M&A activity in the commercial property sector, for example, or deals done and mergers done and, and asset sales and so on than there has been so far in the renewables. At least that's my impression. But you think that's definitely going to accelerate this year and that will be one means by which perhaps this sector begins to re-rate a little. Yeah, I do. I mean, M&A always seems to take a bit longer than we think, but we've now had wide discounts for approaching 18 months and it feels like shareholders are getting a bit impatient with some of those discounts and, and liquidity on certain names. And so we are likely to see a pickup in transactions. You mentioned some of the discontinuation votes. I mean, there is a difference, as you say, between a discontinuation vote and a continuation <laughs> vote. But I mean, I've noted some of the names are coming up. So we've got UK Wind, we've got Foresight Solar, we've got the Aquila Fund, as you mentioned. And the trigger for these is if they've been trading at a discount of more than 10% for their latest financial year. Have I got that right? That's right, yes. Yeah. So the likes of UKW, Foresight Solar, Next Solar, JLN will all trigger discontinuation votes based on discounts wider than 10% over last year. Aquila's actually a scheduled continuation vote because they had a continuation vote last year and they've got another one. The board had to promise another one this year. And that one's interesting because there was a meaningful vote against continuation the last time around and not much has changed in the year since. At the moment, as things currently stand, most of these are going to fail the discount if the discounts remain where they are. I mean, they're all trading at more than 10% discount at the moment, I think. Is that right? Yeah. So the discount measurement period was for the most part over candy year last year. So they've, in effect, they've triggered those discontinuation votes. Now, actually, we think the discontinuation won't pass in, in a lot of those funds. So the funds will survive. But it's a good thing to hold the board's feet to the fire, basically. Yeah. So a discontinuation vote is, is less of a barrier, perhaps, to continuing than, than a continuation vote is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ironically, yeah. <laughs> but so there'll be sort of negotiations, I guess, between shareholders as it approaches, and boards will be trying to put their best foot forward. Do you think, though, at you know discounts of more than 10%, you think that there is value in this sector then, trading off the various factors you've talked about? Yeah, I think there certainly is, yeah. There's... Um the underlying revenue generation and cash flow assumptions and cash flow is going to be strong for at least the next couple of years, given they've sort of locked in to the high prices in sort of 22 and 23. You've still got conservative valuation assumptions across the board. What we thought was interesting, actually, for the, some of the solar funds is the Thorough Council, the Toucan Energy portfolio was sold, well, it's due to be acquired by Schroders. And if you look at the valuation on a pounds per megawatt, that's bang in line with where the UK solar funds, so Next, Foresight and Bluefield hold their portfolios. So again, that's a good comp that shows, you know, that there's potential buyers out there for the assets and where they've got their portfolios marked is broadly in line. So that's actually helpful for them. But on the risk front, I guess there's always the risk of regulatory changes and perhaps possibly some impact from a change of government if we look ahead towards the end of the year. There are some things that have got to be clarified this year on on both those fronts, are there not? So we've got the election. I mean, actually, I think both sides of Parliament are actually broadly supportive of renewables. And we've had the windfall tax, the electricity generators levy. But you're right, there is one thing to look out from from the regulatory front, and that's last summer the government consulted on changing the payment structure of ROCs, which the subsidies that most UK operating wind farms and solar parks get. As part of that, they may change the indexation mechanism, so possibly move to CPI or change the way that basically inflation compounds in the revenues for these subsidies. So that's something which was consulted on last year, that consultation closed, the industry pushed back on that. But we we may get some news on that. So that's something to sort of watch out for. And if there were changes which were negative, that would have an impact on the potential uh, stability of cash flows going forward if they're not inflation linked in the same way as they are now or whatever changes they might make. Have I got that right? Yeah, that's exactly it, yeah. So perhaps we should have a quick word about battery storage, which is a kind of subset of this renewable energy field. And they've had a bit of a torrid start to the year, I think it's fair to say. There have been significant uh, sell-off there, which uh, I must say surprised me a little. But uh, what's behind all that? So the near-term revenue generation of battery storage projects and the the funds in turn have been very difficult. So battery revenues have basically halved for GB batteries since sort of mid of Q4 last year. And so that has a knock-on impact on the fund's own revenue generation and therefore dividend cover. And so the dividends across all three funds are uncovered. 
And Mm -hmm. the market has basically been digesting that. And what we've been out there saying is that these dividend policies are, it's for the funds to pay sort of fixed dividends and try and progress those dividends. But in reality, it feels like they may need to change their dividend policies and move to more sort of flexible dividends where the dividends are based off the revenue generation in a given period, basically. And so um, if revenue generation is really strong, you know, there's a lot of volatility in power prices and a lot of opportunity for spread trading for batteries, then you'll get some high dividends for a few years. But if the revenue generation environment is weak, then you'll get low dividends. I think they need to incorporate that flexibility. So basically, they've got to move, as you say, to a, a more flexible dividend policy, or it seems that way. And obviously, investors don't like that because the yield is one of the, the main attractions of all these trusts in the renewable energy sector. And well, these, these they've gone to big discounts, haven't they? Gresham House Energy Storage is nearly on a 50% discount, I think, now, mm-hmm. having lost nearly 30% this year or so, something like that in share price, mm-hmm. or more, actually. So um, has the market reaction been overdone, do you think? Is there actually uh, an opportunity here? There may be in time. Look, the long-term case for batteries is intact, is that as more renewables come online, we will see greater volatility in interstate power prices. It's just the short-term outlook is very difficult with these low battery revenues, and particularly as you've potentially got dividend cuts coming down the track as well and the funds at the moment the share prices can't be supported by buybacks because the funds have got a lot of their free cash committed for construction projects so they don't have a lot of flexibility with that regard so it's i think it's a challenging near-term outlook but still a stronger longer-term outlook i think that's the story so if you look at the headline yield and some of these are 10 percent or so you want to be very wary of that let's move on then and talk about listed private equity Always a popular topic. Again, we've seen some signs of progress in the last two, three months here in terms of re-rating. What's your overall view on the sector and what are you expecting to see or looking out for this year? So this year, I think we're going to see a recovery in exits, but that's from a very low base last year because the exit environment was terrible. And why we think we're going to see a recovery in exits is because we've got to a situation where a lot of investors in private equity funds, so the private funds, are basically turning around to the managers and saying, look, we can't invest in your latest fund or commit to your latest fund unless you give us some capital back. And so there's a lot of pressure on the private equity managers to basically deliver some exits. And those managers have been reluctant to sell assets for a couple of years because, you know, they're not getting anything like 2021 valuations but I think they're going to have to basically relent at some stage and sell some holdings. So that bodes for more exits. So that's a good thing for our listed funds. But is it going to re-rate the funds? Well, it's, it's helpful in terms of releasing some capital for their commitments and also potentially buybacks. But we don't think it's the thing that's going to fully re-rate those funds. What will help those funds re-rate is actually a broader based recovery in public equity markets. Because, you know, we saw some strength last year, but that was largely owing to a small subset of names, you know, the Magnificent Seven. But if we can get a broader recovery in equity markets, that will close the valuation gap, which opened up in sort of late 2021, early 2022, where public equity markets fell by, let's call it sort of 20%, but listed private equity valuations didn't fall by as much. And so when public equity markets recover, what private equity valuations can do is recover by a smaller extent and close that gap. And then in turn, people are more confident about the valuations of the funds and the discounts start to contract. And we had John Singer, the chairman of Pantheon International, on the podcast a couple of weeks ago, and he was quite interesting. He said, having worked for 20, 30 years in private equity and venture capital, he said, as actually, if private equity trusts were a bit more serious about uh, taking their shareholders seriously, they would do more to try and eliminate the discounts And he said, in theory, there's no reason why they couldn't get back to trading at par. But very few of the larger trusts have ever traded at par. Obviously, exceptions like specialist funds like HG Capital Trust and so on. But um, do you think that there's some validity in what he's saying? I think it's a great aspiration for a chairman in that sector to have, particularly on behalf of shareholders. There are a lot of challenges for getting back to par. We've talked about a re-rating in the sector, and there's definitely upside to where discounts are. But then I also think there's a structural discount for these funds. Part of that is because of the illiquidity and the lack of visibility on the marks. Even though when they do sell things, they tend to sell things that uplift to to carry in value. But mainly it's because for 15 years now, so basically post the financial crisis, this subsector has struggled to find new buyers. 
what you had pre-GFC is you had wealth managers investing in this space and you also had various private fund investors would park capital in listed funds waiting for their commitments to be called and then they would sell down etc but those types of investors just left in the GFC and, and never came back and we've struggled to find a sort of consistent buyer for this sector which would, which would help it sort of re-rate so um no, look, it's a great aspiration and you know, Pantheon have done some very shareholder friendly things of late, but I wish I could be that positive. <laughs> yeah, well, it takes some doing to do it, let's put it that way. Yeah. 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 So there might be some re-rating and of course, this is one sector where if the cost transparency and presentation issue is resolved, we might actually see some benefit or do you think that's already in the price? We've seen a bit of discount movement so far. I think the one thing we know for sure is that the cost disclosure issues have weighed on this sector more heavily on others just because the weight of cost is higher than other sectors. So if there is a positive impact from rectifying these cost disclosure issues, then the one subsector you would think you would see it will be listed private equity. So then that just brings us on quickly to a sort of subsector of private equity, if you like, which we call growth capital. So these are the, the trusted invest in much earlier stage companies, higher risk ventures. And well, they've been uh, performing rather better, haven't they, recently? They're obviously more sensitive to interest rates, I guess, than uh, some of the larger funds. What's your thought across this sector? There obviously, some very different animals in here. We're talking about Chrysalis, we're talking about Shehalian, and uh, if you include the biotech sector, we're talking about RTW and Syncona, among others. So um, what do you think is going on there, and do you think that's going to be sustainable? So if we just focus on Chrysalis and Shehalian, the, the, I mean, a common thread between those two funds is that they both got a number of businesses which are large and mature enough to be IPO-ready. It's just currently public equity markets aren't ready to support those IPOs. So in a, in a chrysalis, it's a smart pension, a starling, a Klarna. In Shehalian, it's a bite dance, it's a Stripe, it's a SpaceX. But, you know, we've seen a few bits of IPO activity in the wider market to date, so that's helpful. And if they can get some IPOs away and get some liquidity, then they're in a good position to return capital. And discounts are still wide. So I can see why the share prices are, uh, are performing pretty well. They've rallied very well since uh, October, certainly. Moving on quickly then, you have some interesting thoughts on shipping. Obviously much in the news at the moment because of what's happening in the Middle East and the attacks on shipping going into the Red Sea. What are your thoughts about that sector? It's obviously a small sector, only a couple of trusts there. But what's your thinking on that? They're obviously benefiting from that. But uh, are there underlying reasons to be positive about the uh, outlook for those as well? Yeah, if you look at which vessel types are held by the funds, so in, in telemaritime, it's handy-sized bulkers, so it's basically smaller bulkers, here in dry bulk, in the minor bulks, and in Tufton, it's also about 50% handy-sized bulkers, but 50% tankers. And the outlook for both of those vessel types is good. Supply of both those vessel types is very limited. No one's really building any new ships. And so it's really about the demand side, where you get stronger demand. And now with what's happening in the, in the Red Sea and various ships having to avoid that area, they're taking some sort of supply out of the market. And if we can get some better news on the demand side, and particularly some, um, you know, given the GDP sensitivity of the sort of dry bulks, then that bodes well for, for both funds. Finally then, Matt, we have to talk, because everybody else always talks about it, about the uh, Tangle situation at uh, Hypnosis Songs Fund, ticker Song, where that sort of saga of the kind of test of, I see it rather as a trial of strength between sure. the management company and the and the newly reconstituted board and the shareholders, of course. What's your reading of that situation? How is that one going to end, do you think? Clearly, there's a strange relationship between the board and the manager at present. What's interesting is whether the board continue with that manager or they serve notice of termination at some point. Now, the board have to come back with proposals for the reconstruction or the wind-up of the fund by the end of April. So I suppose the question is, as part of those proposals, do they stick with the incumbent manager or do they seek other arrangements? I think that that's the big source of uncertainty when over the fund at present. And I guess uh, when you're talking to the clients about this, I mean, one of the questions is, is this a case where there's a good business trying to get out of these issues around the management contract and valuations and so on? Or is it actually perhaps the end game here is, is a different one, which, we again, we would see the departure of Song from the listed market. Do you have a take on that? I think the, the key thing is there is value in the underlying catalogues and there's value in the NAV of Song. I mean, the NAV they've published, I don't think it's the right NAV, but it's probably not a million miles off. 
So it's all about can you untangle the situation with the manager, the call option, etc. And the fund is is over leveraged and does need to repay debt. But if you can do that via some catalog sales and you can get to a better place in terms of the management of those catalogs one way or another, then it could be a going concern. It's a big portfolio. So you could sell catalogs and there could still be a sizable nav left as a continuing vehicle. Right. So this is interesting. I mean, I've been looking at the share price of Hypnosis Song, and it's currently, I think, around 70p, something like that. So it hasn't actually moved that much. There was a little flurry of interest, and then it sort of stabilized a bit. So I guess people are just still trying to work out how this game will end, and if that value can be unlocked. And, and of course, the relationship with the management company is key to that. Yeah, it is. I think that's it. And I think it's just, at the moment with the board, it's 4D chess. I mean, it's a very, very complicated situation. The board seems to be making progress by the announcements they've made publicly, but there's still a lot of work to do. So summing up then, your clients, you say you're cautiously optimistic, and you'd be in the same camp, would you, about the alternatives as a broad sector? Yeah, I think we have to be. I think this year, the sector will start to have a bit of a shake-up and We'll probably see a, a number of funds going to wind down, some M&A activity. But I think ultimately that's a sort of creative destruction process. I think the, the sector will emerge stronger from it. Well, let's hope so. So that was Matt Hose, the lead alternative asset analyst at Jefferies. My other conversation this week was with Peter Hewitt, who is the manager of the CT Managed Portfolio, has two share classes, growth and income, and you can essentially take all the income of the portfolios out through the income shares and take capital out of the growth shares, broadly speaking. So, Peter, we've talked obviously many times in the past. And well, last time we talked, we were still at the in the sort of trough of despond as far as investment trusts were concerned. The ratings continue to widen and so on. But we had a bit of a pickup in the end of the year, last couple of months of the year. But it's been a bit flat so far this year. What's your take on what's going on out there? Well, Johnson, great to be back on the podcast. I think we chatted last time in October. And at the end of October, it's not that long ago, the average sector discount for the investment company sector had hit 19, which apart from a very short period prior to lockdown in 2020, is the widest it's been this century. So it just shows you how kind of unloved investment companies in general were with the investing public. And then things changed. And I think they have changed really quite significantly. And it's important. I want to get this message across. Firstly, from a macro context in November, we saw, yes, central banks were holding interest rates, but forward looking statements, clearly the peak had been reached. And at some stage, you're going to get reductions probably later this year. Then you had one or two really good inflation prints in America and here, and suddenly things were moving forward. And what we'd had up to the end of October, the previous two years, was the FTSE 100 big companies, a few big defensive companies, oil companies, performing reasonably well, and most of the rest, mid-cap and small-cap, underperforming very substantially, investment companies also. That changed on a sixpence. In November and December, I think the FTSE 100 was up about five. The 250 was up 14 or 15, as were investment companies. And that was really quite marked indeed. So mid and small cap picked up the leadership of the market, along with this feeling that a soft landing is possible with interest rates coming down later in 2024. And in January, it's probably gone a bit far, a bit fast. You've seen some of that reverse. The numbers for January actually were the FTSE was down 1.3, the 250 was down 1.5, and investment companies somewhere in between, down also 1.5. And so there's been a bit of a sell-off, and I think that's partly because expectations particularly in bond markets, of potential interest rate cuts got too exaggerated. Talk of six or seven cuts this year. That's far too much. And the recent, we're speaking on Friday, from the Fed on Wednesday and the Bank of England yesterday, tried to dampen that down. And I think expectations have become a bit more reasonable in terms of where interest rates will go. But the important thing is, 
I think day by day, week by week, it's getting less likely we're going to have a severe recession. You may have a bit of a technical recession. You may not. The US economy is doing quite well. And that's important for profits and earnings from companies. So if this unfolds the way I've kind of been trying to articulate, this is actually a really positive environment to be considering investment. The average sector discount is now 15, but you've got some cracking value in trusts. And so I am on the front foot, you could say. I've got two or three key themes in the portfolio, but both portfolios, the growth one in particular, has responded quite strongly in the last three months. So Jonathan, for the first time for ages, (laughs) I'm genuinely quite optimistic for the balance of this year. Splendid. Well, that's very good to hear. Let's hope you're right about that. As you say, there's been a positive response to the interest rate expectations, probably overdone a little bit. But in terms of the rally in investment trust ratings, which we've seen, I mean, it's interesting that the last couple of months we saw ratings come in for both alternatives and for conventional equity trusts. But this year, it hasn't been quite the same story. The alternatives have sort of gone backwards, essentially, a little bit. In particular, one or two troubled sectors like battery storage, we might talk about, has gone particularly badly wrong if you happen to be invested in those. So what do you think is explaining the difference between you know, equities and the ratings there have been reasonably steady, it's fair to say, and the alternatives have, have sold off a bit? Well, I just think probably expectations got too exaggerated. We're not going to have interest rates collapsing from over five in the UK to, say, two or some. If they did that, that's because we've headed into a really nasty recession. And we're not. Employment is full. Wages are now growing in real terms. It does not feel like we're about to head into a nasty recession. Yes, the economy is not doing brilliantly. It's going sideways both here. US a bit better. Europe probably a bit worse. But I think that's what's caused the problem with alternatives. Because what we've learned now is quite a number of the subsectors within alternatives are quite sensitive to bond yields and interest rates. But I think that is probably a relatively short-term thing. I'm hopeful you will see a better performance from some of the alternatives as perhaps we move closer to potential rate cuts maybe in the summer. So that's my feeling on alternatives, Jonathan. So one of the interesting things, though, is interesting comparing what's happened in the commercial property sector and the infrastructure renewables space. There's been a lot of kind of activity in the property sector, mergers, asset sales, that sort of thing. But the renewables have only sort of really started to show signs of actually taking more positive action about their discounts quite recently. Would you agree with that? Is that a fair summary? Obviously, they will be doing more this year, but do you think that's going to happen and be helpful? It would be helpful. I think it's unlikely you'll see the same extent of corporate activity, merger acquisition activity you've seen in commercial property. It's just not as easy to buy in loads of shares if your underlying assets are wind farms because they are inherently liquid. But you have seen at the margin some crystallisation of value with some smaller sales within portfolios, I think both in solar and wind and even in core infrastructure as well. Also, in the short term, revenue generation has been under a bit of pressure because power prices have come back. So I'm not too concerned about that. I don't think it's going to impact dividends for renewable stocks. And you actually have some smashing dividend yields and reasonable growth in certain cases. So I think they'll not be in the front line of kind of recovery. I think that will lay with equity trusts. But the better managed ones with not too much debt should be fine. And I suspect you'll see discounts beginning to tighten in a little. You have an income portfolio and you have a growth portfolio. Are you worried about the potential for dividend cuts across your portfolio? I mean, there has been one or two dividend cuts. And again, this week we heard those battery storage trusts, they've both suspended their dividends because of their revenues have fallen so far. Is that a concern? If you look through your income portfolio, are you concerned about dividend cover or dividend cuts in one or two of these alternatives particularly? Well, we have had one or two dividend cuts. Will we get more? Within my portfolio, I don't think so. I don't have any battery energy storage holdings. And although from a high level, you can see the need for what they do, no question about that. But I do think it's in the kind of 
shorter term, the revenues that they've been generating have come under significant pressure. And to be honest with you, it's one of these things. I have listened to presentations from some of these companies and I never quite fully understood all the different sources of income of revenue that they get. It's not easy. It's quite complicated. And I just put it in the too hard category until they perhaps had grown a bit more and and maturated. And I don't think we're there yet. And in certain cases, there's quite a bit of debt involved too, which is a problem. So I think they're ones just to be cautious of just now. And probably cutting the dividends is the right thing, but does no help to the share prices. Across the board, in the other areas, you know, I've got impact healthcare, care homes. They just came out with great results and 100% let, 7.5%, 8% dividend yield, covered, not heavily indebted, dividend growing at 2 or 3%. I mean, seems all right to me and uh, not an exciting company, but it's on a discount of about 20%. And I don't think it should be. I think the shares have got a decent capital upside from here. So, you know, Greencoat UK Wind, their dividend's been growing strongly. The NAV came down a fraction because of lower power prices. But in the longer run, it's extremely well placed and also not over indebted either. So I think I'm interested. I mean, one of my key themes going forward for 2024 is in the alternatives, which is private equity. And I think there's some really very interesting value there, but also decent growth prospects as well. And it's an area I have been adding to. I mean, it's pushing 20% now of the growth portfolio. And recently I've been buying more Pantheon, who, by the way, were in the market yesterday, buying quite a few hundred thousand shares. So they're continuing to support that price there. And you've got a discount now in the mid 30s, which is way too wide but it was in the mid-40s, and the NAV has been picking up, courtesy of those quite aggressive buybacks. But the underlying companies they're invested in are doing fine. So I think you've got quite an opportunity for well-managed private equity trusts, HG Capital, Oakley Capital. I visited them recently, and I'm really quite impressed with them. I think they've got quite a bit to go. ICG Enterprise, Pantheon. There you go. And I think all of these ones, I mean, Apex, NB Private Equity are in the income portfolio. And I am really quite confident about all of them. I think the discounts give you an interesting opportunity. You mentioned that's one of your themes. What's the second theme that you've got in your portfolio at the moment, uh, Peter? Well, the second theme is our UK equity trusts and particularly ones with a mid and small cap bias. Now, they have underperformed substantially until November. Then they turned around quite sharply, but in almost all cases, the discounts there. So Henderson Smaller Companies, which despite its name is mainly in the 250 mid caps and Mercantile, which is the large trust that JP Morgan run also in mid caps, share prices up 12, 15% in November and December, given up a little bit in January. But if you look at the discounts today, Mercantile's probably on 12 Henderson Smaller's on 14. So there's been no discount tightening at all. I think the outlook there is really quite good. The underlying portfolios are really attractively valued. You've got probably decent profits and earnings growth coming through. That's where the recession side of things could undermine it if we did fall into recession. But if we're not, then I think you could really see as interest rates come down, I think that will throw the spotlight on trusts like that. Aberforth, that's another one. I mean, goodness me, they came out with a special dividend, reasonable results very recently. I think the outlook there, portfolio that's probably on seven or eight times earnings, at small cap mainly, but really interesting. Aberforth's on a 12 discount today. So I think these are trusts that could deliver some super results. And not just specialists there, even more general UK trusts, which have got a decent portion of the assets in mid and small caps. Fidelity, Special Values, Law Debenture, Lowland, Aurora. Now, that's been a real winner of late. And I think that could continue. So these trusts, most of them are actually still at double digit discounts. I think that's an opportunity. And so I've been trying to capture that in both portfolios, to be honest. 
So as I say, you've got a growth portfolio and an income portfolio. And I noticed that the yield on your income portfolio is somewhere in the region of 6.5%, something like that. That's pretty good by your historical standards, I would say. And if you don't get dividend cuts, that's a pretty solid underpinning before you start thinking about possible or possibly not getting some capital gains as well. I mean, absolutely, Jonathan. You know, we might come on to hypnosis. That's one I've got that has not paid its dividend, that's not helping the revenue account. But most of the others, the underlying dividends coming through from equity trusts have been quite good. And I think they will continue to be okay. So we may have to use reserves a little this year, financial year to end May. But I think the dividend should be fine. I think the outlook beyond that actually is... I'm reasonably confident. And do remember, the other thing about the managed portfolio trust is you get this transfer of income between the growth portfolio and the income portfolio. The growth portfolio is yielding about 1.5%. So dividends that are paid to holdings in the growth portfolio get transferred to the income portfolio, therefore boosting the revenue account and the potential to pay out dividends. Now, in return that 1.5% gets transferred from the income portfolio to the growth portfolio, supporting its capital growth. So it does diminish the capital growth prospects of the income portfolio a little, but it does boost the prospects for dividends, which I think are, I mean, that's an attractive yield. So just on that, do you actually think in terms of a general environment, obviously people talk a lot about style and things like that, But uh, do you think actually we are moving into a period when things may change such that income investing generally or value investing, which is a kind of flavor of that as well, is going to do a bit better than the growth stuff that we've relied on? There was surprisingly good performance from growth stuff last year, but uh, some people seem to think we're moving into a different environment. Would you agree with that? I think I would. But all I would say is we have to put that in context. Really, up until the end of 2021, you had about a decade where with interest rates at nothing, really, that was very favourable for growth and not very favourable for value. Now, interest rates have come up a bit and certainly value has done quite well for a couple of years. I think you'll find it will be more balanced going forward, which is better for value, given that it was so out of favour for such a long time. And so I think, yes, it's important to understand whether the trust you're investing in has a growth style or a value style, But actually, I'm slightly less concerned about that, unless you have trusts at the very extremes of either spectrum, very, very deep value or extreme high growth. I think somewhere in the middle, it's just good stock selection. And so going forward, I'm a bit more agnostic between growth and value as we go into 2024. Well, we mentioned hypnosis, take a song, the music royal distrust, which has occupied probably a, a disproportionate amount of time on this podcast. I'm shocked to discover we're coming up to our fourth anniversary quite soon, which means we've done something like 200 episodes. <laughs> and we've probably devoted more time to talking about song than anything else, just because it was very interesting and curious at the beginning. And it's a chance to talk about one's very curious uh, musical tastes at the beginning. Uh, but now it's become a sort of saga, really. It's a, it's a soap opera almost, I would say, where <laughs> it's sort of unfolded into a tussle between the, the management company and the board, uh, the newly reconstituted board. And opinions seem to still differ quite widely about what the outlook is. So you're a holder. So presumably, you've been disappointed by the most recent developments. Share prices sort of slip back again. Discount remains quite wide. But are you confident the new board is going to get a good outcome for this and that there's still a good business in there somewhere? I think I am. I think what will be frustrating is it may take a while, but underlying, you've got some really quite interesting assets that actually are growing and revenues are improving. So that's good. The corporate situation is not easy to understand and um, it's going to take a while to resolve. But I think the new board, I've got the bit between their teeth and I would suspect you will see actions over the next ensuing months, which will improve the share price. The asset value, I think the reported one's about 135 or 6. It may well be a bit lower than that, but share price at 65, 67 is discounting horrible outcome. And actually, I think you could have quite decent capital upside in the share price. It might be later this year, but I'm a holder and it has been 
perpetually disappointing this thing. Often with recovery situations, they do take quite a bit longer to come through. But you can see beginning, some of the actions of the board are definitely more shareholder friendly. And I think you could see a change of management at hypnosis. I'm not sure. But I'm watching it closely and hoping... What would be the best outcome from your point of view, Peter? Would you rather that the existing management company carries on, but presumably given up their call option and that, or would you actually rather see a new management team come in and do something different? Probably the latter. I think you know, confidence amongst shareholders with the Hypnosis Songs team is low, and debt is still quite high, and it's sort of diluting any returns. I mean, if somebody came in and bid for the whole thing, I think you would find it proud. It was a decent price. Shareholders would be rushing for the exit door. So I suspect something along those lines may be a resolution, but honestly don't know. It's quite a complex, difficult situation. But hopefully we'll get some decent returns out of it. I'm certainly not selling at these levels, if I could say that. Okay, so... That brings us to a sort of close here, Peter. But I have to finish, of course, with uh, not only talking about hypnosis songs, because we always like talking about that, but we've also got to discuss the rugby. There's always something big happening in the rugby world, and you are a distinguished former rugby player. And unfortunately, well, I say that as an Englishman, you're also a Scot, and you support the Scottish team, as you should. It was a rather limp exit from the World Cup, I think. There were quite high hopes about uh, your team going into the World Cup, rather limp exit. But are we going to see the Scots doing, well, they performed quite well last year and the year before in the the Six Nations. Are we going to see them putting in a good challenge this year? Well, Jonathan, it was a very unfortunate draw in the World Cup, which was clearly rigged against Scotland. However, in the Six Nations, they've got a difficult game at Cardiff. You know, form would indicate they should win it. And if they do, Scotland could have a decent season. I think the biggest game we're doing this podcast on the Friday will be this evening between France and Ireland. They're the two best teams. I think Scotland and England are somewhere in the middle and they play at Murrayfield later this month, a game I shall be attending. And so if Scotland were to beat Wales, they then play France, who've not got a great record at Murrayfield, will organise a very cold and rainy day for them. And you never know. And then it's England. But having said that, When Scotland go to Dublin, which they've got to do, it's never been a happy experience. So I think that's the way I'd like to hold it. They have a chance, but no more than that. We're obviously hoping all the home nations do well. I think England might surprise on the upside. So there you are. Well, I will say, having been to Murrayfield a few times to watch some games, it can be a very uh, forbidding place to go, not least because every part of you is frozen stiff and the rain is coming down, as you say, <laughs> and the supporters are very raucous. So uh, mm-hmm. I hope that's how it goes this year for you. Obviously, Scotland against England, the old sort of battle is always a keenly fought affair, shall we say. And yeah. I wouldn't like to predict the outcome, but uh, we'll see. So, Peter, thank you very much. That's very helpful. Always good to talk to you. And, um, well, let's hope that your optimism is justified as we go through this year. There's all to play for, should we say. Yes, indeed. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you for listening. The Moneymakers Weekly Investment Trust podcast is independently produced and edited and is listed on all leading podcast channels. You can also sign up at the website money-makers.co to be notified every time a new podcast is available. Please note these podcasts are provided for educational purposes only and nothing you have heard from any of the speakers should be regarded as constituting investment advice. If you want more news, analysis, interviews and other investment trust content, don't forget to look at the Moneymakers Circle, available now for a modest subscription at the website.